Hi everyone, you're very welcome to today's FameLab event at Galway. As many of you will know, FameLab is a global science communication competition that takes place all across the world, run by us at the British Council with our good friends at Cheltenham Science Festival. Of course, many of you will also know it's a slightly bittersweet moment for FameLab, as the global competition cycle will finish this year, though we really look forward to finding new ways to work with our alumni and partners in Ireland in years to come. Speaking of partners, I want to say a special thanks to our core funder Science Foundation Ireland and our sponsors CPL and Henkel. And of course, today's event wouldn't be possible without our good friends in GMIT and NUIG. Thank you so much. And to the rest of our regional partners around the country also. So, I hope you enjoy today's show, whether you're a participant or an audience member. And I'm really pleased to hand over to our host. Hello and welcome to the FameLab Galway Heat. My name is Dr Fiona Malone and I will be your MC for this evening. FameLab is very dear to my heart and I'm thrilled to be with you all online this evening. For those of you not familiar with us, FameLab is a competition that develops people in STEM to engage with the public. And tonight, each contestant will give a three minute presentation on a STEM topic of their choice, STEM being science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. PowerPoint and other presentation tools are not permitted, but they can use props, as many as they can fit on the screen. Our wonderful judges, who I will introduce shortly, will be looking for the three Cs, content, clarity, and charisma. And we'll have the opportunity to ask our contestants questions after each talk. For those of you at home, you will also get to flex your judging muscles as well. Feel free to engage with us and comment online and cheer your favourites on. Don't forget, you can communicate with us on Twitter um, with at FameLab and the hashtag, hashtag FameLab. So to our judges, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And first up, we have Professor Leisha McNamara. Hi, Leisha. Uh, Leisha is a Professor in Biomedical Engineering and Vice Dean for Research and Innovation in the College of Science and Engineering at NUI Galway. Her research in bone mechanobiology is at the interface of engineering and biology and informs medical device design. In 2019, Professor McNamara was named Researcher of the Year by the Irish Research Council for her research in bone mechanobiology and osteoporosis. Thank you so much, Isha, for joining us this evening. Our next judge is Kieran Coughlin. Kieran, hi Kieran. Kieran hi, is a <laughs> Kieran is a mechanical engineering graduate of NUIG who's worked for over 20 years creating software for the oil and gas industry at Wood. In recent years, he has investigated augmented and virtual reality for industry amongst other projects. And in his spare time, he's a coder dojo mentor. I'm definitely going to chat to you about that later. That sounds amazing. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, third up, we have Dr. Trish O'Connell. Hi, Trish. Uh, Dr. Trish O'Connell is a lecturer in biopharmaceutical and medical mathematics and statistics in GMIT. Whilst these aren't laugh a minute subjects, she is nevertheless a passionate believer in the power of communication with a dash of humor to connect with students. And this has unsurprisingly sustained her and her many students through the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I'm very excited to see what you're going to bring to the table, Trish. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, our, um, our final judge is Professor Daniel Carey. Hi, Daniel. And uh, Dan is the director of the Moore Institute for the Humanities and Social Studies at NUI Galway and professor of English in the School of English and Creative Arts. He was elected to the Royal Irish Academy in 2014 and is a board member of the Irish Research Council. His teaching interests include Renaissance literature, Shakespeare, Renaissance drama, the 18th century and Romanticism. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Daniel. Great to be here. Thanks a million. Um, next, we're going to move to the FameLab Galway participants for this evening and the running order is as follows. First, we will have Aoife Hill, then Kyra, uh, Kyra Manai Hamilton, David O'Sullivan, Ashley Shiel, Rumia Basu, Michael O'Donnell, Federica Mataferi, 
Debeshmita Dutta, David Callahan, Victoria Sanchez Munoz, and Michael Getrick. So there are 11 contestants and participants this evening. So best of luck to all of you this evening. And remember to engage everyone at home in our chat box below or in the uh, live feed below. Um, so first of all, I suppose we should kick off with our first contestant and get the show on the road. Our first contestant is Aoife Hill. Aoife is an applied mathematics graduate pursuing a PhD in biomedical engineering at NUIG with a focus on biodegradable polymers. She dreams of improved understanding and awareness of energy limiting chronic illnesses, having had one since childhood and cake. <laughs> she also dreams of cake, which I think we all dream of at some stage. Um, her title, uh, the title of her talk this evening is Biodegradable Plastics, So Versatile. I love a pun and I'm excited to see the first talk this evening. Best of luck, Aoife. Have you ever needed stitches? Maybe after an injury or a surgery? Did you have to get them gradually removed? Or did they disappear? Over 1800 years ago, a Greek physician, Galen, described cleaning out wounds with diluted wine. I know, such a waste. And using gut string, typically from sheep intestines, to sew severed tendons in gladiators. Sorry to the squeamish people out there. This is one of the first reports of dissolvable stitches. Despite how frequently stitches are needed, with one company making enough each year to wrap around the world six times, there was little advancement in the materials used until well into the 20th century. At this point, synthetic dissolvable stitches were introduced. Made from biodegradable plastics, they contain tiny repeating pieces bonded together chemically. When placed in the body, the bonds gradually break and the smaller pieces are then safely removed, much like this marshmallow will be. The applications of these materials are far ranging, not only as temporary body implants, but also, for example, as disposable coffee cups. These will then break down more quickly than the 50 plus years needed for a styrofoam cup. The length of time these materials in general takes to break down varies greatly, relatable as a PhD student, and it can take anywhere from a few weeks to a number of years, depending on factors such as polymer type and size. If we want to develop new products, we must ensure that the design process factors in a suitable end of use time. If, for example, the first attempt was found to disappear too quickly, it would be reasonable to assume that making it a little bit bigger or thicker would result in a longer degradation time. However, the opposite is often true. While experimental studies can be carried out, they can take years to complete. On the other hand, a computer model can factor in information about the material and mimic the degradation process. Not only does this save on time and money, but it also reduces reliance on animal trials. And we're all about saving the animals. If we continue to develop these models, it should be possible to create an improved and wider range of products. In terms of benefits, think less reliance on permanent metal implants and slow degrading single use plastics. Now, the next time you need stitches, hopefully in the far distant future, or have a takeaway cup with the words compostable or PLA on it, I hope you take a second to appreciate the incredible journey that scientists and engineers have been on to develop these over the last 100 years. Thank you so much, Aoife, for that great talk kicking us off this evening. And now I turn to our judges for some questions. Professor McNamara, I might ask you for the first question of the evening. Hi, Aoife, thanks for your talk. Can you explain to me the challenges with uh, figuring out the end of life for your biodegradable implants? Alicia, thanks very much for the question. So in terms of challenges, really tiny changes to the sample can affect the behavior quite significantly. So if we just made it slightly bigger, it can behave completely differently. 
if we want to, it's like some products will, we only want them for say 10 days in, in the case of some stitches. Other implants, we want them for much longer. So if we first do that uh, in an experimental study and we find out after the year or whatever that it hasn't gone to plan, we have to start from scratch all over and we're still relying on hoping for the best that after we make some tweaks and another year goes by that it will be working as we want at that point. So with the computer model, we can make those changes and we can try to factor out, factor in how exactly the behavior is changing and what causes those changes and uh, implement that into the computer model and then get results much quicker. Thank you so much, Aoife. Um, we might take one more question from uh, Kieran. Hi, Aoife. Thanks very much. Um, Aoife, I was, I was curious when you talked about um, the relationship between kind of thickness and the amount of time it takes for the piece to degrade. And, and I was curious if it was possible to explain in layman's terms what might be happening inside the material. Do you get little sites of of kind of impurity or something at which the degradation occurs, or is it something like that? What, what is the mechanism there in as far as you can explain it to the, to the average person? Thanks for the question, Kieran. So what's happening there is in thinner materials, uh, the surface is, we'll say much, the parts that are in the center can get out much quicker. And what happens is when they, these bonds are breaking down, acid products can develop so in thin materials, these acid products can escape quite easily. In thicker products, these acid products, or thicker samples, the, the acid products get stuck in the middle and they can accelerate the degradation then. Cool, thank you. And I guess that's, and that's something you're including in your computer models. Um, Absolutely, and, yeah. yeah. Excellent, thanks. Thank you so much, judges, and to Aoife for kicking off this evening. Great job. Um, we might move on to our next uh, contestant this evening, Kyra Manai Hamilton. So Kyra is originally from Wales and a PhD student in parasitology, and I have had to practice that word a lot this evening, with UCD, Ag Research and Chagask, based in Galway. She is investigating drug resistance in sheep parasites and how resistance may impact parasite biology. Her talk this evening is called Life Through a Purple Haze. Best of luck, Kyra. You may be wondering, why am I wearing purple glasses? Well, I'm dyslexic and purple helps me read. Now, dyslexia has been thought of many a time as a bad thing. And I won't lie to you, it certainly comes with its challenges, which is why being diagnosed early is essential in order to help us understand and interpret the world. Now, dyslexia at its core is a learning disorder. It's genetic and heritable. There are a lot of myth understandings when it comes to this extremely complex disorder. Now, myth number one, reading and writing letters backwards is the main sign of dyslexia. For some people, this is true. However, this is a very common sign in young children that they are just simply learning to read and write. For me, I have problems with comprehension, memory, reading, writing, and visual interference, or as I like to call it, alphabet soup and letter spaghetti, which is where the purple glasses come in. They help stop the words from moving and help me decipher what's happening. Myth number two. Dyslexia goes away once you learn to read. Now, there are no quick fixes for dyslexia and it's a condition for life, which is why it's essential that early diagnosis is conducted. I remember English class in high school where I would be waiting anxiously to see if I would be picked on to read aloud that day. My heart would be racing and as soon as I turned the page, the letters would be running and running with no stopping or stalling. The alphabet soup would be undecipherable and I wouldn't understand what was happening. And myth number three, you just need to try harder to read and not be lazy. 
Now, laziness is a buzzword that's commonly used for people with dyslexia. It's been used against myself. Now, the sentiment is fine, but for some dyslexics, it doesn't matter how many times we read something, whether it's five, 10 or 15 times, it may still make no sense. Now, I think of myself as proof that dyslexia is not limiting, nor is it synonymous with laziness. I'm a PhD student and I plan on developing a career in science communication. And I've worked very hard to get this far. And at times like this, I'll think of people like Steve Jobs, Thomas Edison and Albert Einstein, who I like to say succeeded, not despite, but because they had dyslexia. Thank you so much, Kyra, for that really interesting talk. Um, we'll go to the judges now and see uh, and listen to their questions. I might go to you, uh, Dr. O'Connell, for the first question here for Kyra. Okay. No sweat da, Kyra. Um, Kimru Ambeth, etc., etc. I'm also Welsh. Well, Welsh Irish, anyway. I have a question for you, and that's this: Is the dyslexia predominantly with the English language? Does it happen in Welsh as well? Does it happen in other languages? Thank you for the question, Trish. So for me, it happens in both Welsh and English. Now, I've been learning Japanese for a while, and I can actually read the kanji and the katakana because my brain associates mm -hmm. the sounds easier with those than it does with Latin letters. So a lot of the problem I have, and many dyslexics have, is we have a problem with processing the sound in relation to the letters. We do a lot of our language processing on the right-hand side of our brain, whereas normally people process language on the left-hand side of their brain in three different spots, comparatively. I promise, Kyra, I did not ask her because she knew Welsh. I swear I didn't know that. <laughs> Um, I might turn to you, Professor Carey, if you have any questions for Kyra. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. Um, could you explain a little bit about the purple glasses, which which look terrific, by the way? But uh, how do they how do they assist the process of unscrambling? So when I'm reading, if it's normally on a white background with black letters, it's the contrast between the colors for me that causes the confusion. So it literally looks like alphabet spaghetti, and you know alphabet soup and lettuce spaghetti, it's just a mess. Um, so what it does when I use the color is it decreases the amount of contrast between the black letters and the background. Now for different people, it can be different. So my sister uses aqua. I've got a cousin who uses blue and another cousin who uses red. It just depends on your brain and not everybody with dyslexia will use colors to help them read. It depends on the individual and how their dyslexia affects them. Thank you. That is so interesting. Thank you so much, Kyra. That was brilliant. And thank you to the judges for your great questions. Um, we'll move on to the next contestant, David O'Sullivan. David is a marine biologist at Marine Institute and Infomar. He's responsible for the development of Infomar's value-added program aimed at enabling the sustainable development of Ireland's marine resources. The title of his talk is could you hide Mount Everest anywhere else? And I think this sounds great. Best of luck, David. Hi. Could you hide Mount Everest if you're so inclined? To answer that, I'm going to use my son's Lego, which is very kindly donated, and satellites. Now, there's probably thousands of satellites orbiting Earth as we speak, and some of them are programmed to do different things, like map the surface of the planet. And they do that using radio waves, or in some cases, lasers, and they bounce that radio wave from the, from the satellite to the surface and back up it. We can calculate the two-way travel time, and we know the speed of sound or the speed of light if necessary, so we can um, tell how far away the satellite is. So it's how we make high-resolution maps of the entire planet. It's how we make high-resolution maps of all the planets, actually. So if we turn the satellite around and bounce the, the radio wave all the way to Mars, for example, uh, we could paint a very clear picture of what's going on on Mars. The Mars lens is held very well to uh, satellite imaging because it doesn't have any water. It doesn't have much of an atmosphere. So there's very little impedance for the satellite to go from A to B. So we can stitch all these images together in what's called a digital elevation model and have this fantastic image of Mars. Uh, we've seen some great things like the tallest planet in the solar system, which is Olympus Mons, and it's 25 kilometers high. Anyway, 
back to Earth. Got that satellite, turned it around, so now we're facing our planet and we're sending radio waves on it. We can only make a high resolution map of 30%. That's because the other 70% is covered in water. And radio waves or light waves uh, get refracted through water, so we can't uh, make a very high resolution map. Back to Everest. Um, at 8,848 meters high, it's the tallest mountain on the planet. So could you hide it somewhere? Well, you couldn't really hide it anywhere else on the land, could you? I mean, it would seem that anybody could see it from anywhere. So um, you could theoretically hide it and see if there's somewhere deep enough to put it. Here's Everest, not to scale. Now, the deepest part of the ocean is the bottom of the Marianas Trench. It's called Challenger Deep. It's 11,011 meters deep. So yes, you could plunk Everest into it and still have 2,163 meters of water above it in which to hide it. However, Everest is so large that it affects the gravitational field around it. And that means that it can grab the water above it and imperceptibly pull it towards it like this. And this is called a sea surface anomaly. It's only about five meters, maybe four or five meters high and over across maybe five or six miles. You wouldn't see it, but the satellites could see it over time. And this would give a very low resolution map of the sea floor. This is the kind of data that makes up um, Google Earth, for example. It's called satellite derived altimetry data. It's coarse resolution that gives a good indication of where things are and if there's the features on the seabed, but you can't really do much with it bar that. Now today is World, o World Oceans Day. So if we need to manage a map our marine resources effectively, we're going to need high resolution maps to do that. We're going to need to know exactly where these features are and how big they are. There's currently only about 15 or 20% of the oceans mapped in high resolution. Ireland, for its part, has 80% mapped of its waters, so we're well ahead of the curve. Something to bear in mind. Anyway, back to the question. Could you hide Mount Everest? Yes. We're running for a little while. Thank you so much, David, for that uh, great talk. It's definitely an answer to a question I didn't know I needed. And we'll turn to our judges now for some questions. We might start with you, Kieran, for a question for David. Sure. Thanks, David. That was very, very interesting. Uh, certainly wasn't what I expected, I must say. Um, and so I've certainly seen kind of maps which purport to show, say, the you know Mid-Atlantic Trench and stuff. So, would it, be right, would it be fair to say that that is mostly, a, to a large degree, there's a guess going on what's down there that we really don't have? It. We only have a picture of what's kind of in relatively shallow water that can be done with sonar. Sorry, I'm probably answering the question more than asking it, but... It is a guess in some areas, and it depends where you're looking. So for areas like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, they're well studied. Um, they're important um, sea features, sea mountains and whatnot. So a lot of surveys actually happen out there. We have good acoustic data and that's hydrographic data where the sonar is actually in the boat and it's using sound waves to go up and down and painting that very, <clears throat> excuse me, high resolution picture. But the sea actually is very boring between the Mid-Atlantic Ridge to Europe and the other side to America. It's fairly flat and there's not a whole pile happening. So there's no real need unless you're doing a specific survey to have a very hyper accurate survey done. So a lot of that is guesswork. There's a lot of guesswork done in the Pacific, but it does depend on those areas. So we use the satellites to discern where the areas of interest are, and then we can focus our surveys further. Thanks for that. And maybe, uh, Professor Carey, have you any questions for David? Uh, yeah, I was wondering whether there are there any uh, sort of naval applications to this, I mean, in terms of the risk for, for shipping. There's a lot of risks, oh, sorry, the risks for shipping. There's a lot of, um, a lot of things you can do with seabed maps. They basically underpin and enable um, a whole host of uh, areas of activity and, and study in the sea. Um, at the very at its very basic level, uh, safe navigation. We need to know exactly how far away the top of Mount Everest is from the sea, so a ship isn't going to run into it. That's it, that's actually its fundamental reason. But other than that, you can tell what type of habitat lives there. You can tell where these sea mountains are, and, mount, and mountains like if Mount Everest was in the bottom of the ocean, it would be covered in coral reefs. It would found um, what would form what's called an upwelling, and it's a um, a haven for biological life and this high degree of biodiversity. So by mapping these sea mounts, we know where biodiversity and different species live as well. So we can get habitats, we can get safe navigation, we can look at fisheries resources, oceanography has an instance there, and also if you want to, for instance, put in a marine and renewable energy test centre off the coast of Cork, you need to know what type of ground you're putting it into, and seabed maps can do that for you too. 
Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone. David, we could talk about this all evening, but we better move on to our next contestant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, judges. So our next contestant is Ashley Scheel. She is currently a PhD student at Maynooth University, and she went into the sciences in her mid-30s. She has previously worked in a wide range of interests, from working with animals to playing in a band. Ashley is keen to explore her creative side in the area of science communication. And we're very lucky to have you, Ashley. Your talk title tonight is How Partial Pins Came to Be and Not to Be. Best of luck. Hi, I'm Alice and I do my banking online. And when I need to access my account, I have to put in a partial pin, which is three digits from my six digit personal access code. Hi, I'm Bob and I want Alice's money. So how am I gonna get this? The answer is with a great deal of patience. So partial pins originated from phone banking where they were used as a way to verify a person's identity without revealing their full pin to the person on the other end of the line. Flash forward to the golden age of the internet and partial pins are not as secure as originally believed. So how do I guess Alice's pin? Behold this cup, which contains six balls. Now, don't be alarmed. You have not just clicked on live bingo. It's far worse. It's a maths lesson. So imagine each ball is assigned a random number ranging from zero to nine. So if I want to guess one number, the chance of guessing this is one out of 10. For two numbers, it's one out of 10 multiplied by one over 10 and so on. For six numbers, the chance of me guessing this is one out of a million. Okay, so now I have Alice's phone and her bank asks me to input her partial pin. So that's three numbers. So this is her partial pin. The chance of me guessing this is one out of a thousand. But if I guess this correct, I now have three numbers from her full pin. If I go to make another guess, it may ask me for two of the numbers I already have. Then I have only one number to guess. If I guess this correctly, I now have four numbers from her full pin. And I've whittled down the probability to one over a hundred with two left to go. So I can make a guess each day and eventually I'll guess Alice's full pin. The partial pin is slowly being eased out of use with Irish banks now requesting you put in your full personal access code. And so the partial pin must join the floppy disk and the credit card imprinters, amongst others, in the great digital graveyard. Rest in peace. Thank you so much for that amazing talk, Ashley. The great digital graveyard, and there's a line I'm going to take with me. Um, we'll turn to our judges now for some questions. So I might turn to you, uh, Dr. O'Connell. I know you might have some research in this area or interest in this area. I don't know about research, but thank you for explaining it to me, Ashley, because recently enough, my bank, which is the AIB, no ads at all intended, they changed from going from my PIN to my phone number. I'm thinking, why? Why are you doing this? And now I know. Is there anything even more secure that you think that we might be going towards? Maybe um, biometrics or something? Yeah, biometrics has has have their own issues as well that I've I've been researching all of this kind of stuff. Um, with regards to partial pins, um, actually, uh, AIB was I think I'm not sure about all of the rest. It's it's quite difficult to actually get information from from banks and stuff mm -hmm. because they don't publish you know records of of these the people's accounts being hacked into or anything like that but AIB is one that changed from their partial pin to their 
full access code and it was strange because my mother said the same thing recently she said yeah. how come they don't want you now to put in the and I had three to digits say, oh. yeah and I said um, funny you should ask but I'm actually doing this talk on this subject <laughs> um, yeah because um, but not all banks there is still some that are, are using uh, partial pins but they will have an extra feature on top of that so they'll have uh, second factor authentication so like mm -hmm. for Bank of Ireland you have to then go to your phone and it'll you need to confirm that that's you going into your uh, bank account but in my scenario here I have Alice and Bob and if Bob already knows uh, is living with Alice and has her phone he's going to already have her phone that's the scenario I'm setting up that he has her phone and he knows already her, say, the pin. You know, he can look over his shoulder, get her pin. So he will have access to her phone to confirm that second factor authentication in that scenario. You know, so it's a kind of a slow process, but it's not completely impossible. So there, that's why they're kind of weaning them out. And there is also, also other reasons. Um, for instance, when you hash passwords, list of passwords, you uh, you can't hash the partial pins and partial passwords. So they're okay. kind of, if they're kind of discovered, the, you know, they're not mixed up. They're not hidden like a full password would be. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another issue as well. Thanks for that. Fabulous. I really enjoyed that. Thanks. I need to go like double check all my passwords and everything. I'm getting awful <laughs> anxious. Um, Nisha, we might come to you for a quick question. Hi, Ashley. Ashley, Hi. you talk about this in terms of people getting information and accessing your account by, you know, guessing or, or knowing some of the, the numbers. What about the role for sophisticated uh, algorithms for, for trying to hack into your accounts? Where is, um, I suppose, the state of, let's call it science, in terms of the, the ability and, and the speed by which an algorithm could uh, guess this uh, password and and is there a real risk there that maybe you know full pins themselves won't even uh, uh, overcome the the computing power that could guess these uh yeah well there is algorithms that can um uh, guess passwords say uh unhash passwords extremely quickly with numbers like that that takes a, a there is a whole there's actually a, a list online that you can check to see how long it could actually uh, take to guess a certain password and computing power has you know gotten so much better and obviously people are able to even google this kind of stuff or buy it on the dark web that kind of you know technology um but um it does th th this the the more kind of social engineering seems to be a much more popular way of kind of getting people's information in this way kind of more it's easier to kind of do um in that regard rather than going out and buying and it also takes a lot of computing power um so i'm not sure about you know whether people can take guest passwords in that way um it would take a, it would still take a long time because that's what I'm doing in my research. I, I use an algorithm that's guessing six digit pins via their partial passwords, and you know it takes it's, it takes a long time. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was brilliant. Um, just in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next contestant. So our next contestant is Rumia. Rumia Basu is a PhD student uh, jointly at Chagask and at NUI Galway and has a Master's of Science in Geoinformatics. Her research deals with studying changes in the environment and the climate using remote sensing technology. The title of her talk this evening is From Space to Farm. Best of luck, Rumia. Did you try some gardening during the pandemic? Well, I did. And needless to say, failed at it miserably. Apart from realizing that I have a love and hate relationship with my plants, I also realize that I do not like touching soils and wet soils that too. But what can you expect in Ireland where the only weather that I can define is as being rainy? But there is something that I do like about the rains, and that is the beautiful, soothing aroma of wet soils. 
which is because of the chemical called geosmin. Chemistry apart, let me ask, how many of us care to look at the ground when it rains? We appreciate the green grass, the beautiful flowers all around, and also the occasional rainbow that peeps from behind the clouds. But what about soil? Something that goes unnoticed so easily is actually one of the most important variables governing the climate and the weather system. Did you know that soil is listed as one of the essential climate variables by the Global Climate Observing System? Now that we've established that I do not like touching soils, ironically, as a climate scientist, this is what I do. I study soils and how? Well, I make use of the myriad of satellites that circle the earth and get all the information that I want at my fingertips without even touching soil. I study soil moisture, how it changes with time and what it could mean for the local weather and the climate system in general. Now, this is very important for Ireland where the economy is dominated by a grass-based system and where the soils cannot drain all the water effectively that falls on them. This could mean really bad news for grass growth. Therefore, I get all the relevant information on soil moisture, their status and pass it on to the farmers who can then decide how to manage their farms better. This means the grass is greener, the cow is healthier and hopefully the farmer wealthier. So next time it rains, my friends, bend down, pick a handful of soil, take in its aroma and know that what you are holding contains a catalogue of information about the past and the future climate. Oops, just when you thought the story gets interesting, it starts to rain again. Got to go, folks. Bye. That was so good, Rumia. Thank you so much for that talk. We'll head to the judges now for some questions. I might come to you, Kieran, for a question from Rumia. I feel like there's a story about a basil plant or something <laughs> we were chatting about earlier. Yeah, so I'm talking about my, my failure, Rumia, to grow a successful basil plant, something I've failed at many, many times. And my wife is not sympathetic. She says it's just food. Um, so I can't get her to support me in this effort to keep the basil plant alive and thriving. But I have one at the moment that's doing quite well, so fingers crossed. So a question that jumped out at me, listen to that, was... Um, Obviously, monitoring the water content of soils via satellite is a great way to, uh, to get a lot of data over, t and over time. Um, are there trends in that data that, are, that are, can be seen uh, uh, both kind of nationally and globally? And is there anything interesting about that? Uh, well, I think uh, in order to monitor soil moisture and over the past few years, there have been a lot of uh, satellite uh, data that have been in use, but they were at a coarser resolution. So globally, I'm talking about uh, efforts in monitoring soil moisture. So there was the soil moisture active passive and other uh, sensors, you know, which would give you information on soil moisture at a resolution about 40 kilometers, which is very, very coarse if you want to uh, go down at the farm level, which I'm trying to do for my research. And then um, there's the other problem of, uh, you know, optical data versus radar data, their limitations. So, for example, when I talk of Ireland, which, which is dominated by this rainy climate, which I say, and coming from a country which and in a place which doesn't always get so much of rain. So um, there's also this, um, this problem and this debate of what kind of data you want to use. Probably for Ireland, you would want to use microwave data, which is not limited by weather. And also... Um, there are there are different ways uh, in in terms of global soil moisture monitoring efforts. So um, in in the sense that what what kind of data you're using is obviously the first thing. What resolution you're looking at is the first thing. Then also there is um, how how well you're able to validate um, your remote sensing based results. So how good a network of in situ data that you have. So these are some of the areas where, where there's continuous ongoing research. And I think um, as far as my knowledge goes for Ireland, there is, there's nothing uh, like, a blow, like a soil moisture monitoring network. So, and the methodology that I'm trying to develop and use, um, I think is sort of novel at the moment. So getting down to monitoring soil moisture at higher and higher resolutions, I'm using Sentinel data, obviously, which is 
um, developed by the ESA, the satellite. So let's see how well we can um, get on with it. Thanks, Rumia. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rumia. And just in the interest of time, we might uh, let you off the hook and move on to our next participant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you might resurrect your basil plant there now, Kieran, after all of that information. <laughs> So our next contestant is Michael O'Donnell. Michael is, was the winner of 2017 BICS Person of the Year and EU and Eco UNESCO recognized environmentalist. Mike, a former member of UL's Mosaic Group, now vides his trade with Regeneron in their column packing team. His, type, his talk this evening is titled A Miraculous Secret. Good luck, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, Okay, that you going in a sequence. Have you wondered how you're going to lose the Quarantine 15? On my case, the Quarantine 45. Do you believe you possess a small bit too much of sweet tooth? Or do you believe that eating healthier would be easier if food was nicer? Well, I might just have the answer for you. From the faraway land of East Africa, I bring you the miracle berry. This small fruit from every green tree in the region can turn sour taste sweet. I'm not lying to you. I can guarantee you by using this you can remove the high fructose corn syrup, the sugar and sweetener from your meals and eat them naturally so it's healthier for both you and the environment. So the question is how does this do this? Well, here in nature we don't have funny things such as patents expensive lawyers, or GMOs. Instead, we have evolution. So, in the case of medical berries, we have evolved a protein that binds to your sour taste receptors. And here's the cool thing. Once it does this, and is exposed to acid, it changes the shape. And guess what's acidic? Sour things. So, by <clears throat> Say, eating this lemon, instead of a bitter taste, like you're used to. I get a taste like sorbet. So why is this important? Firstly, the obvious reason. Diets. So instead of using a massive amount of caffeine, which is currently used in diets, we can use this to remove sugar making the diet way healthier and way more sustainable. Secondly, for chemo patients. So, if any of you had family members who've gone through chemo, you might know what the main effects is on the taste buds. By using this, we can use bitter tastes and sour tastes to allow chemo patients to enjoy food again. Finally, it can be used for diabetics. So we don't have to substitute carcinogenic components into their food to give them the similar taste to normal everyday foods. So, the question is, why have we not heard of this? Well, it's quite simple. It was found too late. While most of our food additives, like high fructose corn syrup and sugar, are grandfathered rule into existence, this was only found in 1970 as an additive and hence has never been approved by the FDA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for that really interesting talk. Um, we'll turn to the judges now for some questions. So, Professor McNamara, I might turn to you for the first question from Michael here. Thanks, Michael. I have a question about uh, the science behind the binding of the coating to your taste buds. Is there any concern that if people were using this, that it might influence the long term function of those taste buds? so that maybe they lose their ability to appreciate non-sweet uh, tastes. Uh, <clears throat> there's actually studies done this before because the novel food under the EU regulation. So what actually happens is the glycoprotein is what binds the taste bud initially. So the glycoprotein will be like any sugar. So when the sugar molecules are there, they will degrade over time. So they won't have the long-term effect. What could happen, though, would be a histone modification. So if I eat, say, miracle food to alter my diet over the next 10, 15 years, 
and my kids did the same. You could start seeing the sour gene being phased out through natural evolution. Same way as you would see in flinches in the glass, of course, with different food sensors and different geek styles. Thank you, Michael. I know you're in your car, so thanks so much for um, logging in with us this evening to have a chat about your talk. The next contestant we have this evening is Federica Modafri. Federica is a first year PhD student at NUIG. Her research focuses on the centromere and how it relates to male fertility in bulls. She's interested in genetics, especially epigenetics and molecular biology. Her talk this evening is, the centromere is not weird, it's special. Best of luck. Do you remember biology classes in school? One of the first things they teach us is that the DNA is like the structure manual of every living being. It is made by the repetition millions and millions of times of four letters, A, C, G, T, called nucleotides. Then after the cell makes a copy of it, the DNA in the form of chromosomes is divided equally between the new cells. You may have seen a chromosome somewhere before and they're usually depicted with an X shape. Maybe the one you saw looked like this. The narrowest part of, this, of the chromosome is called the centromere, and this is the structure that is essential for the correct and equal distribution of the DNA between the new cells after each cell division. Another thing we are taught early on in those classes is that in the case of the DNA, its sequence is extremely important. In fact, unfortunately, some diseases are due to changes in the nucleotide sequence. So now you may be wondering whether this is the case for the centromere as well, and if the centromere is also specified by the presence of a specific DNA sequence, but the answer is no. The centromere at the DNA sequence level consists of stretches of these nucleotides that are repeated thousands of times. However, some chromosomes in some animals, like horses for example, lack this repeated sequence at their centromere but they're still among us and they're doing just fine, then the centromere must be defined by something else, right? Yes, this is the case, but before we go there, we need to take a step back. Do you remember at the very beginning when I said that the DNA is like the structure manual of each of our cells? But now look at us, humans, for example, we are so complex, then the DNA molecule must be so long, right? Yes, in our cells, the total length of the DNA in one cell is two meters. Isn't it amazing? And now another question arises. How does it fit into the cell? Cells are so small, we can't even see them without a microscope, right? Yes, so to fit into the cell, the DNA is compacted in a structure that resembles a pearl necklace. Now imagine that each of the pearls of this necklace are made of proteins that we call histones. At the DNA at the centromere, these pearls are a bit different because one of the histones, one of the histones is replaced by another histone that is called CMPA, centromere protein A. So now you may be, you may have guessed where this is going. This CMPA protein is only present at the centromere and nowhere else on the chromosome arms. So this is how the centromere is specified by the presence of this protein CMPA and why it's special. Thank you so much for that amazing talk. We'll head to the judges now for your questions. So I might go to you, Dr. O'Connell, for a question for Federica, please. Okay, I'm going to guess here. Buonasera, Federica. Um, so my biology is pretty rough, to be quite honest with you. And I remember from, from studying it a long, long time ago that you've got the, I think, are the histones wrapped around the chromatid or is it the other way around? Yes, thank you for the question. It's the other way around. It's the DNA that it's wrapped around the histone. Okay, the and then there's something called the kinetochore as well, isn't there? Yeah. Or yeah. is that so, a figure to the whole centromere thing? Yeah, so basically, Sempe is like the basic, uh, I would say, one of the most important components of the uh, kinetochore. But then, obviously, especially in mammals, there are other proteins, like in the kinetochore, it's mammal 16 at least proteins. 
and then this, you know, the this protein form a complex, and then the microtubules, so, you know, the, this complex form the kinetophore, mm -hmm. and then the microtubules will attach to the kinetophore. That's it. Try the segregation. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And we might move to Professor Carey, please. Could I ask whether there's applications in, 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 in understanding errors in cell division and, 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 and replication in that sense in this research? Yeah, so because the centromere is uh, involved in the segregation of the chromosome, it's very important to understand how it's function because like, for example, in cancer, you might have, I don't know the numbers, but I think it's not that rare that you have, you know, the, so humans normally, like physiologically have 46 chromosomes. And in cancer, sometimes you see that they, they actually have more chromosomes. So, you know, if you have defects in the centromere function, then you don't have the correct segregation. And then you can have what we call aneuploidy, which is, uh, when the one or more chromosomes are present in one of the cells. So, and obviously, you know, in, in I guess in the cell, it is important that every cell has the right, you know, each one chromo one copy of each chromosome, but it's also important the gene dosage. So a certain quantity of gene should be present in a cell to be functional. And so it is very important that chromosome, that chromosome segregation when for the uh, goals directly. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Federica. Thank you. And we're on the home stretch now. Four more to go. Everyone is uh, done so well. The judges have such a hard job ahead of you. Um, but our next contestant is Debashmita Dutta. And Debashmita is a first year PhD candidate studying material science at Tyndall National Institute, who would love to share her love for science and convey the beauty of it through immersive communication. Isn't that beautiful? Um, she's very excited to be able to deliver something distilled enough to be appreciated by the general public. Her talk this evening is on mixing a box of mixed paint. All the best, Debra Schmitha. I think this is, well, looks like a bunch of scribbles to me. Uh, what if I told you that these scribbles actually have three very distinct lines or strands which have very unique properties of their own? Would you be able to distinguish uh, between them and make sense of this mess? Well, you wouldn't be. Um, what if I told you that your noise cancelling headphones actually do this on a daily basis? Well, to understand the complexity of the issue, let's think of it as unmixing a box of paint. If I gave you a box of red paint and blue paint, told you to mix it up real well, and until it becomes purple paint, then give you back the purple paint and tell you, now separate it back into red and blue. Would you be able to do it? Not really. Then how does your noise cancelling headphone really do it? Well, it is through something called a Fourier transform. A Fourier transform is nothing but a mathematical equation that was devised by a person called Fourier back in the 1800s. The Fourier transform answers one of the most fundamental questions of electronics, which is how to separate a signal from noise. And to demonstrate this a bit further, let me do a demo. This is sound A which is a primary pure sound constituting of no other sound other than A. Whereas this is B, which again is a primary sound, which is one octave lower than A, but is pure and has no other constituent sounds other than itself. Now, if I play both of them together, we get something called as C, which is again a completely new sound wave. So you need to keep in mind that your noise cancelling headphones actually hear C. They never hear A or B, which means when I'm talking, you, your headphones can actually hear the rustling of my coat, the rustling of the curtain, the sound outside my house, the construction, the rain and everything. But you only hear my sound and my voice. How does that happen? It happens in three steps. 
One, it first differentiates the input signal. If it's a primary signal, it keeps it that way. But if it's a mixed signal like C, it understands that it is constituted of two things like A and B. And then it would realize, well, I don't really need A, so let me just remove B. So then you would get something called A. And that is my voice that you're hearing right now over the rustling of the curtain and the sound of rain. So this is not really just applied to sonics. This is also applied to electronics and it has made our lives a lot easier. So next time someone gives you mixed signals, tell them to unmix a box of paint. Thank you. Debishmita, that was awesome. I'm an engineer by trade, so I love a good Fourier transform. We'll head to the uh, judges now for some questions. So, Kieran, you're wearing headphones, so you're the first person I think that should really ask this question. <laughs> not, not noise cancelling, unfortunately. Um, thank you, Debish Mita. That was very interesting. Um, this, I presume, the Fourier transform is something that's quite computationally intensive. What's is it become much easier to do nowadays um, with modern technology? Yes. Um, thank you for the question. So noise cancelling headphones nowadays have two different types of them. So there's passive isolation and there's active noise cancelling. So most um, average range noise cancelling headphones usually have passive isolation, which is a much less computationally intensive, whereas active noise cancelling actually cancels out each sound or unnecessary sound in the whole batch of paint, you can say. So that is a lot more computationally intensive than just partially isolating it. And that is what requires, for both of them require Fourier transform, but the one with which does just does partial isolation is the one that is a lot less computationally intensive. Thanks, Devashmita and Professor McNamara. Do you have any questions? Hi, Debbie Smita. Thanks for the um, interesting talk. So can I ask, you know, to the lay person, if you were to describe this, what, what's in their uh, headphones and, and what supports it to allow to do these Fourier transforms? So what's the hardware and the software? Okay. So think of it as um, tea. Whenever you drink tea, you use something called a sieve which strains out the leaves from the water, right? And that strainer is kind of what your noise cancelling headphones hardware actually acts like. Um, sorry, software actually acts like. And the hardware in general is what uh, houses the software. So you can think of the hardware as the uh, metal ring around the sieve that holds it up and can you know, give it the mechanical support it needs to do its job. So it would kind of be a good analogy of what the hardware and the software kind of part of it is. Thank you. Thank you, judges. Thank you, Debashmita. And we'll move on to our next contestant. Great job. Thank you. So our next contestant is David Callahan. David is a first year mature student at NUIG, studying a physics degree in the astrophysics stream. He worked outside scientific field before but is currently really interested to get involved in the areas of science communication and science education. So you've come to the right place here, David. Um, his talk this evening is Atom, Crackle and Pop, When a Star Goes Supernova. Best of luck. When my children were younger, their favourite song was a song called Rainbow Connection by the award-winning artist Kermit the Frog. There's a lovely lyric in the song that says, what's so amazing that keeps the star gazing? And what do we think we might see? while well, I'm going to try and attempt to answer Kermit's rhetorical question. My favourite star is the star called Betelgeuse, which is in the constellation of Orion. Betelgeuse is classified as a red supergiant star. As the name suggests, this is because it's pretty massive. To put it into context, if we were to take the Sun from the centre of our solar system, replace it with Betelgeuse, its diameter would stretch all the way out to Jupiter. But why is it so big and why does it shine in a red colour? That's because it's already fused all of its hydrogen into helium and is now in the later stages of its life. I'm going to try and attempt to explain to you what happens next by the use of my highly technical model. Now, this might look like I've just attached some Lego bricks to a hula hoop and put a balloon in the middle. That's because that's pretty much what I did. 
But if we can imagine if the, the um, hula hoop is the photosphere of the star, that's basically the surface, and the balloon is the core of the star, this is where all the nuclear fusion takes place. Elements get fused together and energy gets created in the form of heat and light, which gets pushed out towards the photosphere and then into the universe beyond. All this energy going outwards is counteracted by the huge amounts of force of gravity going inwards, which keeps the star in a nice equilibrium and a nice sphere shape. Now, this all goes very well until we get to fu the fusion of iron. Once the, star once the star begins to fuse iron, it's in big trouble. This is because it no longer creates energy. In fact, the fusion of iron requires energy for it to happen. So there's no equilibrium anymore because there's no energy being forced outwards, but there's still the huge amount of gravity being forced inwards. So the inevitable happens. And that's a supernova. In that explosion, all of the heavy elements that are in the star get spread out around the universe. Interestingly, the iron that's in our blood came from such supernova explosions as that one did. Now, I think at this point it's best to mention what was going to happen to life on Earth. The good news is, Betelgeuse is very far away. It's between six, and six to seven hundred light years away, which is plenty of distance for us to be out of the way of any blast zone. Also, we say it's going to happen soon, but that could be any time from now to the next hundred thousand years or so. So, Kermit, what do you think? Pretty amazing, right? Well, maybe not as amazing as a talking frog. Thank you so much, David, for that great talk and for Kermit the Frog as well. What a great evening. Um, we'll head to the judges now for some questions. I might come to you, Kieran, for a question for Dave. Hi, David. Thanks for that. Uh, it was very interesting. David, do all stars go supernova? Uh, no, it's 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 on the, the the massive stars that do. Um, for for instance, our sun won't go supernova. It's not it's simply not big enough. Um, at the end of their life, our sun will eventually die, like all stars do. Um, luckily, for not another five billion years, so don't panic too much. Um, that turns then will turn into a white dwarf. It, it doesn't uh, go supernova. Indeed. Um, Betelgeuse is 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 the size of it that that that'll make it um, go supernova. Thanks for that. Thanks so much, Dave. Okay, we're on to our second last speaker of the evening. So thank you so much for keeping with us. If you're still with us, keep commenting and everything in the live feed below. Hashtag FameLab and at FameLab underscore Ireland if you're on Twitter as well. Um, so second last speaker is Victoria Sanchez Munoz. Victoria is from Spain, where she completed her basic education, um, a Bachelor of Science in Physics and a Master's of Science in Theoretical Physics. Nothing basic about that, Victoria. That's pretty impressive. Uh, she came to Ireland to start her PhD in quantum games at NUIG and is currently in her second year. Her talk this evening is watching a boiling pot in quantum physics. All the best, Victoria. Finally here, thanks to the GPS. Have you ever used the GPS or even just your phone? Then for both, you can thank quantum physics because it's almost everywhere in your daily life. Quantum physics studies the tiniest pieces that build the entire universe. Now you think, quantum physics? That is the theory of strange microscopic things that is so difficult, not even physicists understand it. And I say, you are completely right. Very weird things happen in the quantum world and I will try to explain only one of them. So let's start with a pot. Let's say that you want to boil some water and you, know how, you want to know how long it takes. Let's say it takes you five minutes. But now you would like also to know how hot the water gets. So, you place a thermometer and bring it to a boil. The result, of course, will be the same. It will also take you five minutes to bring it to a boil. So, the act of measuring the water temperature won't change the result. However, let's imagine that you have 
an experiment where there is an electron that is a quantum particle and the electron is doing something so you get a result and now you want to measure or to watch the electron while it's doing that thing surprisingly enough the result will be completely different it is as if the quantum particles know if they are being watched or measured and behave differently depending on which case if you think about it that applies to us humans we behave differently if we know we are being watched right but yeah in the quantum world measuring or watching can change the result and since quantum particles don't have a wheel it is very very strange so for quantum boiling pots there could be some truth in saying that a watch pot never boils or even that a watch pot can boil faster but don't do that don't don't stare at your pot it won't work it's too big to see that the weird quantum effect Thanks so much, Victoria. I'm definitely behaving a bit weirder this evening because people are watching me. <laughs> um, so we'll turn to the judges for your questions. I might turn to you, Professor Carey, for a question for Victoria. Hello, Victoria. Thank you very much. Um, how, how, was, how was this discovered? I mean, uh, what, what is the context that this is, emerges from, this anomalous fact of nature? Yeah, um, well, like a small prep. It is based on the double slip experiment. I don't know if you can see that. You have a source of electrons, quantum particles or of light, photons, and you have two slits there and a screen um, in which you see the, the, like the, the particles uh, impacting them, impacting the screen. So you get a picture. So when you run this experiment without like this, what you would see in the screen is a pattern like this, okay? So it's strange. But then on the slits here, on both of the slits, you place two detectors to see if the, uh, which path took the quantum particles, like photons or electrons. And when you place those two detectors there, what you get, it is this which is completely different. This measuring and this without looking. And uh, so that's how it started. It started like that because people wanted to know if light was uh, a particle or a wave. And then playing with that, they, they see that weird thing. That depends on how you do the experiment, you get a result or another. Great, you must be telepathic knowing you were already prepared <laughs> for my question, but that it's, was very it's helpful. The, the logical question, I guess, to, to, to ask, so. Well, that is preparation for you, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it done? <laughs> um, we have time for just one more question. Uh, maybe yourself, Dr. O'Connell, have you any burning questions for Victoria? You can call me Trish, Fiona. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. we're tired as Victoria. Um, I do have a question. If you were to adopt string theory, would your pot boil any faster? <laughs> uh, well, I have studied theoretical physics, but string theory is beyond that. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's beyond my knowledge. Uh, Mine so too. I would say yes, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I watch too much Big Bang Theory. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe too much. Yeah. You took the words out of my mouth. I was going to ask is someone watching a, a Dr. Sheldon Cooper <laughs> yeah. theory. Uh, thank you so much, uh, judges thank and you, Victoria. Victoria. Great work. Our final contestant this evening is Michael McGettrick. Michael is a lecturer in NUIG and has a PhD in theoretical particle physics. He's currently working in quantum computation, quantum information. And his talk this evening, the final talk of the evening, is quantum computing and global warming. All the best, Michael, and thank you for waiting. I'd like to tell you about the number zero and the number one, and about how, as a human race, we have to be careful of what we do with these numbers 
to solve uh, global warming. So what has zero and one got to do with global warming? Global warming is a problem we know to solve by just uh, reducing industry, dirty industry, reducing pollution, stopping human influence on nature, things like this. Suppose we do all these good things, uh, what is left to heat up the planet? It turns out what is left to heat up the planet are processors, things like the computer you're looking at right now or the smartphone you're looking at right now, things like this. Or there are chips and processors in all sorts of gadgets. In my case, there's a chip in my bicycle light, um, but there are chips in fridges, all sorts of things. In fact, soon there will be chips inside the human body, probably inside the brain in decades to come. They all give off heat. Anytime you add this number to this number, or multiply them, or do operations on them, you give off a tiny amount of heat, which is a principle of physics called the Landauer principle, and we can't get around that. And this heat will eventually cause a problem on, on planet Earth. Um, this heat is equivalent to maybe an ant lifting up its leg uh, while he's walking on the moon. So it's a tiny amount of heat, but it's all going to add up. The way to get around this is through quantum computing. In a quantum computing processor, zero heat is given off. So it's the ultimate green computing, and it's not going to heat up the planet. What does a quantum computer look like? Well, earlier I took out the processor from my quantum computer, and I just like would like to show you the processor itself. So I'll get close to the screen. And if you look carefully at the processor here. OK, I hope you didn't see anything there, because there wasn't actually a processor there. If there was a processor, you still wouldn't have been able to see it because quantum computing is the ultimate miniaturization and the processor would have been not alone microscopic but nanoscopic. In other words, extremely tiny, like trying to look at an, at an atom or at an electron. So quantum computing is the ultimate in miniaturization as well as being green, which is a second advantage. The third advantage of quantum computing, it can do great things for certain types of problems. Imagine you are a rich king, you've got a palace a hundred rooms in your palace. You've left your book somewhere. You've no idea which room it's in and you're completely forgetful. How do you find it? Okay, well, there's no better plan than just go through all the rooms in whatever order. You might find it in the first room, but you might be unlucky and find it in the last room. On average, you go through 50 rooms because there are a hundred rooms, so on average, 50. You're going to find it. If you more than 50, you're unlucky. Less than 50, you're lucky. If you had a quantum computer, you can guarantee to find your book after 10 checks, 10 searches. The quantum computer effectively looks simultaneously in a few rooms at the same time. That's the best analogy that one can say of its operations. So that rich king should head straight down to Curry's and buy himself a quantum computer for maybe $2 million. But uh, yeah, he's a rich king, right? Thank you. Michael, I was staring at that screen for ages trying to find, <laughs> trying to find that little chip. Um, that was very, very, very awesome. Uh, we'll move to our judges for some questions. So for our final questions of this evening, I turn to you, Professor McNamara, for Michael here. So Michael, simple question. How does one build or make a quantum computer? Uh, well, you have to mix together a few physicists with a few engineers uh, with a lot of semiconductor physics and uh, other things. But uh, yeah, there's, there's about, there's a lot of different teams, different parts of the world make, making it in different ways. So, so really, uh, and they haven't even decided which is the best way of doing it. Some of them are actually doing solid state physics. Some of them are using lasers. Some of them are using electric fields. Um, but they have built quantum computers. And if you, you can go and see one in, in Austria, in Canada, in Australia, if you walk into the room, you'll see uh, machines with a lot of uh, ele electric machinery. Uh, but as I explained, the, the processor itself will actually be invisible. But the machinery controlling the processor is absolutely enormous. So uh, that's the other side of the coin at the moment. Um, and eventually, we hope that, that will, the machinery controlling the processor will be made a lot smaller. Um, so thank you very much, Michael, for that. And just in the interest of time and the very difficult task at hand for our four judges here, um, the judges are now going to head to a breakout room to deliberate our winner and our runner-up for the Go Away Fame Lab heat this evening. And not to forget, our fifth judge this evening is yourselves at home. 
please let us know in the chat who you're supporting and in the live feed and on Twitter, we're at FameLab underscore Ireland and hashtag FameLab as well. Our fifth judge is everyone at home. Please head to FameLab2021.com. You can see it there on your screen now to vote for your favorite. Um, a slide should pop up and you should get to the site on your phone, your laptop, whatever it is you're using. And don't forget to keep an eye on the live stream comments section as well as you are um, voting for your favorite for the audience winner. OK, so everyone has a voice in this this evening and keep keep voting, keep letting us know in the, the live stream comments who is your favorite and who, who stood out to you. Just to go through a quick recap of everyone, we had Aoife Hill from the Applied Math Mathematics um, and she turned Biomedical Engineering at NUIG. Kyra Manai Hamilton, originally from Wales, and she um, was talking about life through a purple haze with her amazing sunglasses. We had David O'Sullivan asking, could you hide Mount Everest anywhere else? Um, Ashley Scheel was talking about how our inputting our data for our banking 365 and things like that have changed and how partial pins came to be and not to be as seems to be the case. Uh, Rumia Basu was talking about um, uh, from space to farm. So we were looking at the different uh, variations within soil. Michael O'Donnell was speaking to us about his miraculous secrets. So definitely check it out if you haven't seen it already. Federica was talking about the centromere. Debish Mita was discussing about um, unmixing a box of mixed paint, which was the, um, the noise cancelling headphones idea, which was really interesting. We all, we all use things like that every day. David Callahan was Atom Crackle Pop. So that was the one with the balloon. So if you like that one, definitely uh, vote for that as your favourite. And uh, second last was Victoria speaking about watching a boiling pot and how it uh, equates to quantum physics. And Michael Nagetrick was talking about quantum computing and global warming. So absolutely very difficult decision for all our judges, but definitely keep your favorite in mind um, and let us know in the comments below what, um, what you thought of the event. And so now as you deliberate and pick your favorite speakers from this evening and um, we've got some uh, a wonderful interval act for you to to accompany you on this evening so as this is the final year of fame of ireland we invite you to release some of our best acts and this one is really no exception um it's amazing i remember this was the year that i was at the national final in 2019 and dan simpson he's a poet and a writer amused the audience with his science inspired spoken word show so sit back relax and get ready for some feel-good scientific comedy because it's Amazing. Um, enjoy. Good evening, Fame Lab. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, I get it. It's a bit weird being a poet on a bill of scientists. Um, I feel a little bit out of place. Um, I'm going to do a poem about feeling like that, about feeling like you don't quite fit in. Uh, it's also about this little fella, which Hayden's going to love. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 put that away, that's the whole point. Uh, all right, it's a little poem about this fellow, the orange ghost from Pac-Man. Uh, video games, my favorite technology, goes like this. There are four ghosts in Pac-Man, a red one, a pink one, a blue one, and an orange one. I have a lot of sympathy for the orange ghost in Pac-Man. Their names in Japanese are Keibai, Pinkai, Aisuke, and Gazuta. Translated, that means red guy, pink guy, blue guy, and slow guy, <laughs> slow guy, slow orange ghost. Their characteristics in Japanese are oikake, mashubusi, kemagore, and otoboke. Translated, that means chaser, ambusher, fickle, and stupid. <laughs> stupid, stupid, slow orange ghost. Other names they've been given are urchin, romp, stylist, and crybaby. <laughs> crybaby, stupid, slow, crybaby orange ghost. In America, they're called blinky, pinky, Inky and Clyde. <laughs> Clyde, stupid, slow, crybaby orange ghost is not allowed to fit in with the other ghosts with a name that rhymes. Because you're rubbish, orange ghost. You were never good enough for your father, were you? You always failed to get A grades in school and you never learned to play guitar like you said you would. You were the odd one out in your family, mainly because you're orange. And now you're stuck in a dead end job, pursuing a string of loveless relationships and paying for a mortgage on a house that you don't even like. But don't be blue. 
Because you can't be blue, can you? <laughs> orange ghost. For one day, you will show them, orange ghost. You will break out of your shell like a little orange duckling. You will grow into a beautiful orange swan. Stretch your hopes as far as your wingspan and reach for the skies. Achieve flight on an airstream made of more than inert gas. An airstream made of fulfilled ambition and your own power. But if you don't, orange ghost, then I will always be there for you. And that's a pact, man. Thank you. <laughs> Hey. Uh, all right, so uh, yeah, I'm a poet who likes to write about science uh, and I, I suppose the natural output of science, which is uh, technology. Uh, video games are one of my favourite technologies, of course. Anyway, any other video game fans in? Yeah. Oh, I'm surprised, only a few people. I thought we had a room full of nerds. Uh, all right, so, um, yeah, I, I, it's true, Pac-Man, uh, the orange ghost Clyde is kind of programmed different to the other ghosts. The red ghost hunts down Pac-Man, the pink and the blue ghosts uh, chase him down and kind of block him off in various ways. The orange ghost Clyde is actually programmed to run away from Pac-Man if he gets too near, uh, which I find kind of adorable. It means he's coded differently, and I think perhaps we all feel like we're coded differently at times. Uh, so, uh, technology is one of my bags, I suppose. Um, I've talked about video games. And video games go through the process of, of open beta, uh, which any, uh, any uh, computer engineers, any software designers in the audience? Do you have any people who fiddle around with code? A couple of people, yeah. So what you'll know is uh, when you release a piece of software, it goes through this stage of open beta. It's where people kind of test it out and uh, say what's working, what's not, you know, sorting out all the bugs in it and stuff like that. And I think as artists, as writers, we have to do that too. You can't just write a poem and assume it's the best poem that's ever been written, though if you've ever been to a poetry night, You've definitely seen that. Uh, I think science is really good at this. Science tests its hypotheses. Uh, science doesn't say, here is the idea, and I'm stopped. That's it. I'm going to test it, work it out. We're going to peer review it. We're going to confirm whether it's true or not. I'm sure there are no scientists who have an idea and cling to it forever, regardless of the data and evidence that might go against it. So this, is, this poem itself, with that, I guess, spirit in mind, uh, this poem is actually in open beta. Uh, so any feedback you have at the end of it will be massively appreciated. As a just a silly little sound effect to introduce it. All right, it's just silly. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this poem isn't done yet, but I thought it might be useful to test it out. Put it in front of people. Get some feedback about what's working, what's not working, that sort of thing. What people might want to see in future versions of this poem. Do you like the opening sequence? Please let us know. Quick warning, this build of the poem is not for sale or to be professionally reviewed. It is very much a work in progress. We hope to release a final 1.0 version soon, but that will still need updates, little patches to correct any errors, since it's so tough to sort every little problem in a poem like this in any poem, I suppose, for that matter. 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 <laughs> Do you like the pauses in that last line? <laughs> Please let us know. Thank you for your feedback from the first draft of this poem. We have made some changes based on your suggestions and some that you did not ask for. We completely ignored many of your requests. A list of things changed in this version. Fixed infinite recursion at the start. Sorted out that line that suggested Oedipal feelings. Removed all dad's dud metaphors from the poem. Improved strength of end of poem boss fight. Reticulated splines. Patched holes in metaphors. Added verbs. Sorry for any freeze-ups that you encounter, but that's the nature of. <laughs> Autumnal. Flat share. Beyonce. <laughs> Do you like the missing asset here? Please let us know. Some bugs may become features of the poem in the future if they enhance your experience of the poem or are critically praised as aesthetically beautiful. Enjoy the glitches while they last. They ultimately may be more interesting than the final poem. <laughs> this line is in capitals and I don't know how to fix it yet. <laughs> Do you like rhetorical questions? Please don't let us know. Your read through of this poem is important to us. We've put so much work into it, but we can't be bothered to test it ourselves. Do send us an email with any thoughts on this poem, any issues that you have, please let us know. Is the central character strong enough? Please let us know. Save your progress through this poem regularly. In this version, crashes are common, so don't worry if it suddenly... Thank you. Uh, 
Um, so um, I, I love writing about um, the kind of applied technology, uh, applied science and technology. I also like to write about science itself in its pure form. Uh, my favourite scientist, and we all have one. My favourite scientist uh, is Dr. Schrödinger, uh, father of quantum mechanics. Obviously, very famous for his eponymous cat experiment. I, I'm in a room full of scientists and science buffs. So I, you know, the cat's alive and dead in, in a box at the same time, illustrating a quantum state of being. Fascinating, brilliant. Uh, my second favourite scientist. We all have a top three. My second favourite scientist uh, is Dr. Ertke. Yeah, inventor of the frozen pizza, um, uh, legend. Um, yeah, he's brilliant. Uh, he actually is a German scientist, uh, biologist, who invented a kind of portable uh, baking soda, uh, which is why he's well known for his range of baked goods and muffins and stuff like that. Uh, so I've written a poem um, where I've imagined them in the kind of same universe. This is called the Schrodinger Ertke Entanglement. Um, now, the last line of this is basically a punchline. With, as a poet, you can write jokes, whack in line breaks and put it in a book. It's quite nice. Uh, if you get the punchline before I get to it, laugh early and everyone else will think you're very, very sexy. So uh, this is called the Schrodinger Ertke Entanglement. Schrodinger, quantum mechanics, Ertke, uh, muffins. Um, goes this. If Dr. Schrodinger had also been Dr. Ertke and in a quantum universe this is theoretically possible, then we are all in for a treat. Because with Dr. Schrodinger Ertke's products, you can have your cake. Right? Uh, yeah, I'm not even going to do the punchline because everyone's got it. Um, check out my Instagram, I put stuff like that up. Um, uh, that's the Shredding Earth to Entanglement. Um, all right, a couple more from me. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm going to go here. So I think science gives us technology and technology gives us new ways to communicate, right? Um, I think science is a language, mathematics is a language, uh, um, but my favourite language to come out of science is, of course, the emoji, uh, which we all use nowadays. This has massively replaced the old emoticon. Um, and people say kind of the use of emoji is kind of destroying communication. We're here at a science communication event, uh, and how can we communicate effectively in a world where we say things with these little pictorial representations? I actually think emoji are incredibly powerful. Uh, people say they kind of augment text. I actually think we can do a lot more with emoji. So I've written this entire poem in emoji for you. They were hard to rhyme. Uh, I gave it a go, though. Um, this is my poem in emoji. It goes like this. A house party. It's arty, farty, full of hipsters, <laughs> posers, and uh, a couple of jokers. <laughs> and a girl, a boy. Eyes meet. <laughs> I'm glad you like that. That's kind of the basis of the whole poem. <laughs> a smile returned. It's sweet. He waves like a tool. <laughs> Be cool, she thinks. He walks. He talks. A drink. Yep, she says. Be back soon, he says. Two beers clink. Cheers. They're nothing. Silence. They're tongue tied. It's awkward. I think this is the noise you make internally when things are awkward. <laughs> we all make that noise. She says, OK, why did the chicken shoot the comedian? <laughs> he rolls his eyes. She replies, because chicken's sick of their crossing road bullshit. <laughs> he sighs. Oh, man. <laughs> no way. <laughs> so nerdy, he says. But ice broken, they laugh. The music is cheesy. Uh, the Spice Girls, uh, wet, wet, wet. <laughs> uh, oh, the monkeys. This click is really slow, so it's going to take a while. Uh, Beatles, very good. Uh, the Four Tops. All right, you had to guess at the Beatles. Anyone on this one? What do you think? Any guesses? What we got? We got Grease. Grease Very good. Grease soundtrack. Well played. Uh, what do we reckon? What's going up next? Music, cheesy music. Time. Good guess. Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, <laughs> The Doors, the Scissor Sisters, Talking Heads, loads of people, all sorts of people, very eventually, very slowly, snaking around the room and doing the conga. There we go. <laughs> they dance. It's a whirlwind romance. They kiss. They talk. They hold hands. They, from sunset to first light, they kiss. They wish this party wouldn't end. It's like 2 a.m. and it ends. <laughs> they swap numbers. He says goodbye, that wave again, and he leaves. <laughs> the night bus home, she checks her phone. Message received. It's really small. Of all the emojis he could have sent, just one says it all. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Come on. All right, one more from me. Um, thank you so much for having me, Fame Lab. A couple of quick plugs before I go. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, I'm half of a 
poetry uh, science double act I call Dr. Illingworth and Mr. Simpson. I'm sure lots, sure lots of you may know uh, Sam Illingworth. Uh, he's currently in Vienna. Um, to talking at a geological conference. Um, we do lots of stuff with poetry and science, uh, all kinds of performance actually. We like to mash poetry, science and the arts together. We like to put the A in STEM, STEAM. Uh, also, this is me, if you fancy, come and say hello. Uh, and this is my book, which I'm not allowed to sell here, so I definitely don't have copies. Don't come try and buy one from me. Uh, come say hey, Dan Simpson, Poet Everywhere. My book is called Applied Mathematics. Uh, it's poetry. Poetry. It's not a maths textbook. Right, final poem for me. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I feel like what poets do and what scientists do are so similar. We're essentially trying to understand the world and communicate that out. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I actually think that's a thing born of love. Uh, so I'd like to finally end with a love poem for you. Uh, it's called Applied Mathematics, and it goes like this. I love the curvature of your wave form, the way you diverge from the norm. I want to bring you to boiling points because too hot is not too warm. And when we touch, it's an electric storm and you're the lightning conductor to my heightening thunder sound. You're the earth to my live wire. You keep me on the ground. If you were described by numbers, they would all be primes. But like Heisenberg, you're uncertain of where we are sometimes. So this verse is in a language that you can understand, bringing maths and poetry together in double helix strands. Because we've been carbon dating for a while, and sure, I'd made you smile, and statistically speaking, I'd make you laugh sooner or later. So the line on my mental graph paper that represented how I felt about you had an upward trajectory. Marking X's against the X axis, I plot points and Y. Well, because X marks the spot where two lines intersect, connect in a future perfect tense, tell a story predicted by the focus of the locus. But this isn't magic, it's not hocus pocus. Because you, you have no need for the supernatural, whereas I'm odd, I'm not always logical, and sometimes even my numbers are irrational. But you, well, you are the right angle for me. A cute reality to my obtuse literacy, not an abstract. And you pivot on moments like these. Affected by Brownian motion, we dance like particles. And I have this notion that I'm the definite article to your theoretical hypothesis, the words to your mathematics. For this, this is my medium of transmission. And I'm no paranormal magician. There are rules in writing too. Creating literary fiction through rhyme addition, division of lines to ease transition, multiplying meaning by verb position, subtraction of words made more powerful by omission. No, it's not a precise science, but there is a method to it. For example, electrons flow between two polar points. I am the north and you the south. We can't help but be attracted. And we reacted like water and phosphorus to form a compound substance because you plus me equals us and chemistry is undeniable, like electromagnetism or gravity. And though there are sparks of volatility, ours is not a weak but a strong nuclear force. And in all probability, this is how we'll always be, because when we deviate, it's anything but standard, a sign that we're meant to be physical with our biology. And maybe I'm going off on a tangent here. <laughs> But pressed together, our contact force is not normal. Cosmic strings vibrate in harmonious commotion. And when we oscillate in our simple harmonic motion, I think that maybe one day we'll propagate. But that's in the future, in our fourth dimension. I don't want to upset the equilibrium. I don't want to cause any tension because our equation is balanced. You're the constant variable in my life. The quantity for which I did not factor. You keep me powered. You turn me on. You are my chain reactor. The dark matter I do not fully understand. The bright colors on my spectrum. Band. You are pure mathematics, but applied together, we are poetry in motion. Thank you. See, I told you that was really good. Dan is just amazing. Um, so now we're going to welcome back our judges, which I know they've had a very, very difficult time of it. So if we could ask our judges to come back and uh, we'll take some comments from them. Okay, I see very four stressed heads in front of me <laughs> here. Um, I might go to our head judge, Professor Leisha McNamara for your comments on how that whole process went. So, you can see that we, we come back uh, after a prolonged discussion and uh, you always hear the people say it was a difficult decision to make, but it truly was. How do you weigh up quantum computing against soils and uh, head noise, headphones cancelling and, and epigenetics? So it's, it's quite a, a challenge really to try and compare uh, these excellent uh, presentations. And, and we were really uh, quite thrilled to hear uh, these talks and uh, really appreciate the charisma with which each of the speakers brought to, to 
conveying their passion for their topic. But of course, uh, there was only one winner and uh, Fiona, you'll be announcing them and just to say well done to you all and uh, best of luck uh, with your future career in science communication. Fabulous, yeah, I'm buzzing for all of the participants. It was such a strong final. Um, so thank you again to all of our amazing judges. Um, it was a pleasure to work with you all this evening. So first of all, we have our audience winner for everyone that voted at home. Your winner is now below in the live feed. So congratulations. Our next announcement is for our FameLab Galway runner-up who will win uh, a cash prize of 150 euro. And that is Kyra Manai Hamilton. Congratulations. <laughs> Feel. I'm in shock. I didn't expect to get anything because there were such fantastic talks. You were awesome. Everyone was awesome, but massive congratulations to you, Kyra. Well done and all the best in the national final. Oh, thank you so much. And now for our winner of the Fame Lab Go Away Heat 2021 this evening is drum roll. Um Debishmita Dutta. <laughs> Massive congratulations. How do you feel? I feel great. You should. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all the best now in the national final. Uh, Thank yourself you. and Thank Kyra you will so do much. the West Proud. Great job. Thank you so much. And congrats to everyone else. Your talks were amazing. I enjoyed every one of them. Thank you so much for being here. So I suppose all that's left to do now is say a massive thank you to the audience, yourselves at home, all of our wonderful participants, everybody today, and of course to our wonderful judges who had such a very, very difficult um, decision to make. But congratulations to our two winners and our audience vote winner as well. Massive thank you to our main partners, British Council and Cheltenham Festivals, our main funder, SFI, and our supporters, CPL and Henkel, our partners, News Talk, NUI Galway, GMIT, Quorum, Insight, Lero, Met, Marine Institute, Chagask, and the Science Gallery as well. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on this evening's regional heat. So please head over again to famelab2021.com to fill out a brief evaluation for us. Thanks a million and stay safe.